le canto scurrire Mi muove la pire, mi muove la pire Hello, 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 everybody. I'm Miriam Khalil. I'm speaking to you all from my home in Edmonton, Alberta, where I'm currently singing the role of Mimi in Edmonton Opera's La Boheme, and where I also teach voice at the University of Alberta. I'm honored to be facilitating a discussion with some of the artists from La Boheme today. Thank you so much for joining us. Edmonton Opera is grateful for the ability to work learn and create in Treaty 6 territory, Amiskawesi, Waskahikan, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, Nakota Sioux, and Métis peoples. We are committed to honoring the diverse cultures, knowledges, and achievements of Indigenous peoples through collaboration with Indigenous artists. And now without further ado, um, we have with us uh, some amazing artists. I would love to introduce you to our Musetta soprano, Lara Cikiewicz, our, our Marcello, Peter Barrett, our Shonar, Luca Kawabata, and our fearless leader from the pit, conductor Simon Rivard. I'm so grateful to all of you today for giving your time so that we can answer so, so we can ask these questions. Um, we have, I know a lot of students from U of A that are really excited to ask some questions to you all. And I know a lot of people that, uh, that are also tuning in. So thank you for all being here. Um, first of all, now that I have you all on the screen, um, the first question I would like to ask is, I know this has been kind of a time um, where we've all sort of been doing our art differently the last two years um, and so I would like to know how it has felt coming back to a full production like La Boheme for the first time in two years. Lara we'll start with you. Hi everyone thanks for being here. Um, I guess the word that comes to mind most easily is the sense of joy that I felt in this show um, reuniting with colleagues, with old colleagues, um, meeting new colleagues, and getting to actually create music and art together in person again, and feeling what that community really is and what it stands for. Um, I'm really reminded how collaborative opera is and also how human an art form it is. So to actually be in the room where you can see the amount of people both on the stage and working backstage to make everything happen um, has been really, really special. Um, and I think it has also been a really good reminder for me and a privilege for me to feel that um, this collective energy is always capable of making me better than I could be just by myself. And just, yeah, it's really, really wonderful to feel that energy and feel like I can fly, not just because of the work I've done, but because of all the work that's around me and this energy and this wonderful feeling of the entire group in person. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Peter, what has it meant for you? What has it felt like? Uh, I think I could echo, well, first of all, thank you for having <laughs> me here and having Myself in Edmonton, it's been such a pleasure and an honor to make my debut with Edmonton Opera um, and to be a part of this magical production. Bohem is one of my very favorites and um, it's always such a joy and pleasure to do. It's been too long. It's been very difficult. It's, um, if I'm going to be honest, I think it's been um, very difficult on all of us. We've had something taken away that you, once you, you know, having a glimpse of it back is, has really reinforced how much I love this art form. I love opera. I love being on stage. I love creating, collaborating. Um, 
all of those wonderful things. And um, it's been difficult, but but to be back and to have the perseverance of Edmonton Opera, Alberta, it's the only game in town for opera in Canada right now. Um, I've been fortunate enough to do a, a few other projects during the pandemic, but it's all been virtual or it's been under different circumstances. And um, to be able to perform to an audience has been exhilarating. So um, thank you for all that all the people that came out to see the show. Thank you to all of you artists. Um, it's just a pleasure to work with you and see you all again and to meet new artists and, and work with new people. You know, it's always exciting. Luca, you're, you're at the beginning of your career. What, what is this like for you? Who, um, it's <laughs> a big question because coming from, uh, I would say years, I guess now of, working digitally and kind of being in this bubble of trying to work on your craft and not having that kind of collaboration as as both Laura and Peter said of being with other artists and being able to learn from each other and play off of each other it's so fundamental to our craft and so coming to a production like Bohem which is a story of friends and of of young people sharing these experiences. I think it's the perfect, perfect production to come back to performing live in. And just the energy of performing for real people is <laughs> unparalleled to years of now performing. And then at the end of the performance, hearing that that silence as someone's waiting to, to <laughs> hear someone say cut at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, hold it, hold it. Ten seconds. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. And Simon, how are you feeling about all of this? This has been, you know, you, you get to kind of feel all the sound coming at you. What is, what is that like? What has that been like for you, this whole process? Well, it's been surreal because, um, I spent a lot of time doing some some projects during the pandemic, but most of them were online as well, like like many others, um, and involved a lot of you know cut and and <laughs> and like doing it again and with no audience and with minimal interaction as well. Because I I come more from the orchestral world where the the, the barrier between the conductor and the orchestra is a little bit stronger than an opera. So it was very heartwarming for me to come into a process. Um, when the staging rehearsals where you get really like some face time with uh, the artists and, and exchange on ideas and, and listen also to what they have to say with what they, the, the, their um, opinions and feelings about their own characters are. So it's much more personal. So I was, it was very refreshing for me because we're way, we were wearing masks, you know, almost all the time. So this, this personal approach kind of was a, a balm for me. Uh, I was able to to exchange more instead of just you know listening and, and giving advice all the time like you do in orchestra. So that was amazing. And also, as Lucas said, the audience. I mean, it changes everything to be able to hear an audience laugh at jokes when mm -hmm. you know when you see we hear a joke landing or we hear a moment landing. We hear someone sobbing. I heard someone sobbing at the last last show. I mean that that was just incredible. To be able to to live that, uh, I mean, there are no words. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting a little emotional just with all of you talking about it. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is sort of, you know, two, a two-parter. Um, I would like to know what has been kind of the hardest thing throughout this process for you. And you can, you know, be as um, elaborate as you like. And what has been the biggest joy? So um, we'll start with Lara again and then just move um, as we did before. I think for me, the hardest thing has been um, trying to have the discipline to stay separate when I know that it's the thing that will keep us safe. Um, when we're such a group of social collaborative beasts, um, you know, to sit there and see someone you haven't seen um, for multiple years and all you want to do is like throw your arms around them and give them the biggest hug ever. Um, and, but be like, actually that's not the time right now because we have to think of this bigger picture thing that's happening. Um, that's been tough. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think ultimately it's been worth it because then we've been able to make this thing happen because we've made certain sacrifices on social and personal levels for the sake of group safety, totally necessary. And like, thank you Edmonton Opera for everything that you have done to keep us safe throughout this entire process. It certainly hasn't been easy, but my God, we've, we've made it, you know, and that's been amazing. And then um, I guess the biggest joy is just simply doing the thing again, you know? Um, I will say for my own self, I know that in the last almost two years, um, there have been layers of armor that I've put on myself and most of that has been unconscious. And in the times during the pandemic up till now that I've been able to create, most especially when I've been able to create in person with people, have been the times when I feel these moments of that armor just shedding off my shoulders and I feel like I stand a couple of inches taller and I feel like I'm a little more human and a little more um, completely myself. Um, so that has probably been the biggest joy of doing this. Wow. Peter. Um, well, if we're speaking about this um, production specifically, um, I think to the credit we, we've made it but the biggest difficulty was the unknowns i think um because we just we were all going to a goal but um the reality of covid and the reality of the situation um we didn't know if we would make it or not and um we had some hiccups along the road and um you know thank you adam luther for stepping into opening night and doing an amazing job and for Andrew coming back and being as amazing as ever without having any rehearsal with orchestra or ever being on the set because all of it happened very close to the end. That was the biggest, that, that was a very large challenge. <clears throat> and then if I'm gonna be absolutely real, I think um, for me specifically, the hardest challenge is singing in a mask. <laughs> um, we're just not trained to do so. And, um, it can cause all kinds of issues with breathing or tightness or all kinds of things. So we all dealt with that in our own various ways. And some were able to overcome the challenges of that better than others. And um, I just had to, I tried for a while and then I realized that I needed to just uh, mark and then hope that the opportunity was going to come to allow us to sing with that because we were using not just regular masks, we're using N95 masks that are, you know, we were all for our own protection. But it's very difficult to sing opera under those circumstances. But that led to the greatest joy, which was when we got to take those masks off and we sang for Simone um, and we all, I just remember the beaming in all of our faces and looking at everyone and just saying how wonderful it was to be able to sing free again. You know, we felt like we were in a cage, you know, you, you're, you're, we were there at the safari, but we were all in cages. And uh, once we were allowed to um, open the doors and release what we had worked so hard for so many years to do, the joy just poured out and all of the rest of it just came along so quick. But, you know, my, my hope for the future is that this will be um, the way, hopefully we're on the backside of it, but, you know, everyone's safety is most important. So we, we accomplished all the goals. We were able to perform the show and keep everyone safe. So that's all I have. Okay, so we lost Miriam. So Luca, what was the <laughs> hardest question? Thank you, Maestro. Um, it's going um, on the same tangent as, as Lara's Peter. Uh, it's about the fact that I had so many people asking about the process of, of this production. And I kept telling them like, we're so lucky every day to come to rehearsal and to be like, it's still happening. It's still happening. This is, this is so exciting. And it's once we got closer and closer to the show, I just remember being like, Oh, it like this, this is so exciting. We'll see. And eventually we got to opening night and it was like, wow, this is, we can really enjoy this. And it was all those unknowns about just being like there, there could be one thing that, that derails this and 
as all of us know, theater is such a group effort. It's such a family effort that all of us feel this energy collectively. And um, that was kind of a part of a struggle as well, because in this kind of production in the last couple of years, we don't have the same opportunities as previously to spend time together and bond and and really create that family. And so we're we're doing as much as we can, but um, it's 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 not it's not taking the same place as as hopefully a place that we will move towards in the future. And Simo, what has it been for you? What has it been like? I know we kind of it's just been such a crazy process throughout this whole thing. So. Yeah, I mean, the, for me, the, 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 the hardest part, and I, I'm going to go with Peter here, was the singing in masks, because I was, you, you're always looking forward to meet not only, you know, the performers, the, the cast, but to meet the characters, yeah, to meet who, who is Andrew's Rodolfo, who is Peter's Marcello, and all of that. And it was very hard to meet when everybody was masked, but also not really singing. Um, so it took many many days before i had an idea what the show would be like um and so the the reverse aspect of it is that my greatest joy was when i was finally able to meet you know lara's musetta and so i have very specific moments for me that were the biggest joys in that process um the first time i heard cuando and lara you know lara just took the the the, the mask off and and really sang it um, with all her heart was one of the greatest joys. Um, Luca, every time when we were rehearsing the Fandango thing, the, the dance part, you know, you, you're hilarious. <laughs> and that, that lightened the mood. This whole, I think the rehearsal where we rehearsed, you know, the dance part was one of mm -hmm. the best moments of my, of my, of my month in Edmonton. Um, I remember when we did the first run through of a uh, musical run through of the four acts where we were unmasked and f and and the end with with Miriam um, with Mimi's death I think most of us were in tears um, because finally we were hearing everybody's voice for the first time and we were overwhelmed with joy same thing when 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 I finally heard Kijerida uh, that Andrew sang without a mask I think everybody was like completely you know, emotional and couldn't believe that we were doing this and every night it's so important. Like um, one of my greatest joys is, see, is seeing Peter Barrett come on the stage because it's so important. This Marcello part because it sets the tone for the entire show. So as a conductor, where when you're starting and there's the curtain is down and you're like, okay, one, I hope I hope that the curtain will go up. But then <laughs> you see, you know, like this, I'm not gonna have to do it again because curtain didn't work. Yeah, that's, that's the first thing. But then you see. <laughs> Peter come on stage with like his performance persona. Like Peter has a big personality to start with, but the performance <laughs> persona is like, Wah! and then I'm like, okay, it's gonna be a good show, <laughs> you know. So this moment uh, is it's it's good because it's a recurring one, show after show, uh, but also one of the greatest joys of my uh, of my time here. Amazing, Simon. I I have a question for you, and I know that there is a few conducting students watching and I know there's a lot of young singers watching so I wonder um with you know you've worked with people on so many levels and so many different you know uh career trajectories and um in terms of when you're working with a young artist um let's say a young singer will start um what are your expectations of them what do you what do you want to know what do you want to hear and I know that you know the first time singing for conductor is always very nerve-wracking so i i wonder about that um of course i mean the, the the obvious like preparation aspect but for me it's a given you know if if you're prepared you know your stuff um you, you know the notes you know the dynamics you know the traditions you know all of that that's kind of the the first base but the the, the very important part for me is to see who you are to see your personality in what you're doing to hear that you're not a blank slate, but you're coming with a proposition. You know, uh, some some of my colleagues may say that I prefer a blank slate because I want to micromanage everything. But I I would prefer I would much rather have someone who comes with a clear personality and a clear view of what they're doing, and then we can work together. There can be some back and forth. There can be a feedback loop, you know. But if someone comes in 
and is like, tell me what to do, maestro. And I'm like, okay, but I mean, you need to, you need to have something. It's like, it, it's, it's very like in, in theater, for example, in theater, when you come in, um, the director will not tell you every single line of text, what your subtext should be or what your ideas should be. You should come with, with, with something to say, so a reason for each of the notes, uh, even, even I would say plan A, B and C for, for every phrase, you know, if, oh, this is, I, I can do it more like this. I can do it more like this. I can do it more like this. It, 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 it becomes some a creative, a creative environment, creative feedback loop that is much more comfortable for a conductor because it's much easier to, to, to react to something very clear, um, and to, uh, give ideas than to kind of mold something from scratch. So that's what I would say. Baseline is know, know your stuff, but after that, propose something. G give life to your, like, uh, even as an instrumentalist, even if you're performing a sonata, like, give life to it. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for your teacher to tell you, like, this should be like this, this should be like that. Maybe he'll tell you or she'll tell you um, you're going too far in that direction. Like, that's a caricature. That's possible, but I'd rather say that then, you know, in, invent the story for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I totally understand. It is something that young artists feeling agency and having a voice and having something to say, that's the hardest, I think, thing at first. But once you start doing it, once you start feeling that piece in your body, in your mind, and knowing what you want to say and how you want to feel it and how you want other people to feel it, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and I know you work mostly with symphonies um, and how is opera different? Can you kind of talk about that from a conductor's perspective, from your perspective, from, you know, how this has whole, this whole thing has been for you? It's very, very different. Um, the, the main, the main difference is um, one, the time that you have um, as, as a, I feel that opera is very tricky because you feel like you have a lot of time, but you don't have like the first, the staging rehearsals, the musical rehearsals with piano. I mean, they're invaluable. And, and the repetitor is really your best friend. Like Stefan Ayi was my best friend during that time. Um, but there's still a prelude to what you have to do. You know, um, the very first, yeah, you see Stefan here on the, on the very important yeah. and a fantastic pianist. Um, so, but the actual time with the orchestra is so limited. I mean, the whole or, or the whole piece is two hours long, and you have, you know, not even time to do it twice in rehearsal. So it's very tricky. Um, so you think that you have a lot of time, but you you don't. That's the first thing. Second thing is control. Um, when you perform a Beethoven symphony, you have control over every detail, and and the 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 orchestra expects you to have control over every detail, except if there's one or two solos, but in general, you're in control. So you control the timing, you control the tempo, you control the pacing, the dynamic, everything. But in opera, it's really a collaboration between the stage and the pit. There are so many variables in terms of balance. It's, it's very hard. There are moments, Miriam, where I can't hear you at all, but I'm, I'm actually reading your lips because, <laughs> I, I, you know, that's the only way. I can I can you know make the orchestra go with you and I, I respect the artistry of every single singer on stage and if one night they're feeling that they feel that they need to take more time for something or less time for something they need to go forward well my job is to go with uh, and to and to support and to help which is very different than conducting a symphony orchestra in a Beethoven symphony it's a little bit akin to conducting a concerto but even in a concerto um, there are no costumes, there are, there's no set, there's no transitions between one, you know, one action to another action. So there's so many more things to take into account when you conduct opera. So it, it's a different kind of conducting, very different. It's not about, it's about ideal, but it's also about optimum performance. Like all of this must come together and make an optimum performance, not only for you, but for the orchestra, for, uh, you know, the, 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 the direct, the, um, the, the action on stage, you know, you can't just conduct and and follow only your instincts. Like there are some actions on stage. There's a door being closed and you need to start after and all, like, many, many things happening. So it's about creating an optimum performance for everyone. And also the last thing I would add is that uh, in terms of personalities, an orchestra um, is more like a, a, a self, um, 
like it's a machine, an orchestra. There are many personalities in an orchestra, but they want its efficiency and and it needs to get done quick and fast. You know, it's it, it, that's how an orchestra wor orchestra works. Um, so you just you get there, you do your job, you're efficient, and at the concert you just let it, everything go and you're inspiring, and that's that's the orchestra world. In opera, I feel that you have to create to work actively to create a sense of family and create an environment of, of collaboration um, because I feel that singers and I'm like that too so I I, I completely I'm in in sync with that are more um, emotional I guess uh, it, the relationship aspect mm -hmm. of the collaboration is more important and that's also why I'm so happy in um, in the opera setting because that's how I work as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting an emotional connection that I don't get in this regular symphony world. Um, but you also have to work to create that, you know, you have to invest time and you have to create some moments. You have to create some, some, some kind of, 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 of baseline and environment that is conducive to um, relationships kind of blooming during that month. Absolutely. So There's a lot of trust. There's so much trust. That's yeah. that's been a huge thing, even especially right now. I think more than ever because you just saw this, you know, for what three three and a half weeks, and then all of a sudden, so there's a lot of trust. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic, um, wonderful. Um, I have a question actually now for Luca, um, and I wonder if you can kind of pop on the screen. Um, Luca, if I may say so, and I hope it's okay that I say this, that, but you are the youngest um, <laughs> in the cast. Um, no one knows this. We just know it. We know it because, you know, you're our, you're our buddy. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about where you're at in your career um, and training and how this experience has been for you? Um, and sort of, yeah, like just tell us all the things. Mm -hmm. I feel extra young because they asked me to be clean shaven for the show. So I feel like a baby compared to how I usually look. <laughs> um, well, I graduated university right as the pandemic was starting. So I definitely had that moment where I was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? I'm entering this industry that's shutting down and all of my hopes and dreams are, are flying away. And in one sense, that was devastating. On on the other sense, everyone kind of didn't know what didn't know what they were doing at that time. So it was almost the perfect time to to kind of slide in and see where the industry was going. Um, so I am in the first couple of years of feeling like a professional, and um, I am currently one of the young artists at uh, in the Yolanda M. Ferris Young Artist Program at Vancouver Opera. And I was, I had the pleasure of being very heavily involved in their first virtual season last year, last season, where as, us as young artists got to be featured in, in their two of their digital productions, that's uh, The Music Shop and uh, Carmen. And I got to sing lead roles, which is few and far between for, for people at the stages of my career. Um, I have been doing a lot of digital work, which has been an amazing learning opportunity to work with to uh, with sound designers uh, and sound engineers and uh, videographers and see what those kind of skill sets can bring into our art form. Um, but I've also been coming into a, a profession like this. I've been part of not live, but um, productions where I've been collaborating with other um, artists live where all of us have had to be six feet apart at all times. And that is an experience because trying to choreograph a fight scene while being six feet apart is <laughs> something. <laughs> we made it work. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time because the way I see it, the the industry is diversifying, and we are seeing all the ways that we are learning from that, and all the ways that opera as an industry can grow. And this makes me very excited to see how the future will be. Amazing. Um, when you when you were graduating, 
Um, did you imagine that um, you would do a young artist program and what was kind of like your idea? What in your mind or in sort of like what, do you know what I mean? Did it match mm -hmm. or was it just really weird because of how things are? I, this was not the experience of a young artist program that I imagined, <laughs> yes. but um, I obviously applied to, to the, the Canadian young artist programs and was lucky enough to um, be selected to be a part of one of them. We were or in, initially given offers to do a live season. And uh, when that came, that whole season was scrapped. And then we were proposed this. And of course I'm like, Absolutely, I'm, I'm I'm on board. Tell me what to sing, um, it, but it's it's funny because this past year, you think of I, I talked about the industry being a family, and that's not just with with between singers or it's between administrators and uh, designers as well. And last year, I was most it was mostly just the singers um, practicing by ourselves, doing coachings one on one with a coach, and eventually singing together but it has become it has been much more more of a solo sport and i'm yeah. very excited to be to be collaborating uh with other people i've also been part of a lot of online um programs as well through through banff and the the digital emerging artist program with manitoba opera and uh it's been amazing to feel like you're working on your own but the amount of people that that the internet has opened up for me to collaborate with now it has been has been probably one of the biggest gifts of the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. learning a lot, aren't we? Mm -hmm. our, our, our art form is kind of progressing in a direction that was kind of going there, but now we've had to go there. And it's, it's kind mm -hmm. of exciting in that sense. Um, I, I want to ask Laura and Peter, um, similarly to you, Luca, um, what their experience of young artist programs has been um, because we've all we've all done them. I've done one. I was in the Young Artist Program with Peter at the Canadian Opera Company. I know Lara, you did the um, the Atelier Lyrique in Montreal. So just tell me, um, you know, what whoever wants to go first, maybe we'll we'll do Peter first this time, um, just because where he is in my screen. Um, uh, and uh, and just tell us a little bit about what that was like for you because I think these things are going to start reflecting and matching what the Young Artist Program it was for Luca. You know what I mean? So I think we can sort of imagine what things will come out of this. Well, first of all, Luca's fabulous. He's been an amazing artist to work with, young artist. I don't know how young he is, but he's, <laughs> he's young enough. He's younger than me. We did the Young Artist Program in Toronto a very long time ago, um, back in the time when it was the Hummingbird Center that transitioned to um, the Opera House in Toronto right now. And um, it was very valuable to me, I feel. I First of all, off, I would say to any young artist though, that it's not the be all end all. If you don't get into a young artist program, I know a lot of artists that have persevered and um, have gone on to have fabulous careers without. So just because you don't make a young artist program does not mean that your career is over by any stretch of the imagination. Boom. Yes. Thank you for saying that, Peter. So but, to be honest with my, I, I, with that being said, I do think it's a boost and it's going to help people open doors um, quicker and faster. Um, that's, that's the most important thing that comes out of it is getting to know colleagues, getting to know administrators, getting your voice heard, um, all those things. But when it comes to my experience with the young artist program, um, being able to, it was my first time on a big stage. You know, I, I, I grew up doing opera or not opera, but uh, theater work and singing and always being on a stage, but not on an opera stage. And having that opportunity to do small roles or understudy larger roles and see amazing singers um, and learn about conductors and learn about all these things was so valuable and probably most important to learn how important languages are. Um, and my advice is for people to work on your languages young and, um, and, and don't take that for granted at all because it is very, very important. 
not only on stage, but to be able to uh, have conversations with people in different settings from different parts of the world. And it just puts you a step above to be able to have conversations in different languages, Italian, German, French, probably French most important in Canada, but then I would follow with Italian um, and then German. And um, anyway, all very, very important. But having the opportunity to get on a big stage, um, experience that, learn about how important it is to sing out uh, over orchestras, learn about cut and all these things and dramatical effects and um, colleagues and interactions. And, and there's nothing better than um, opportunity or experience. So you just need to do that over and over and over again. And no matter how small the role is, or if you're not, I've had lots of experience covering in my career and um, you have to be ready and you can learn just as much, mm. close to as much by watching as, as doing. And uh, I always took every opportunity I had to sponge everything I could from every artist. And to be honest, I still do. I feel like um, we never stop learning and, um, you can learn from everyone. I have learned from Luca. I have learned from all of the artists here. I've learned from Maestro. Um, and I'm happy to learn and expand what I have because we are always growing as artists and we should appreciate every day that we're on stage. It's not easy for any of us. We've all had our challenges. We will continue to have our challenges, but we are doing what we love and I'm honored to be doing what I love. Amazing. Yeah. Lara. Um, in terms of young artist programs, I feel like it's both this amazing opportunity to just be bombarded with so much information about craft and try a bunch of different things and see what tools work for you now, what tools maybe don't work for you, what tools might not work for you now, but will work for you later, um, to really just expand your craft. Um, but also, I think the biggest gift that I received, um, certainly at L'Atelier, was being able to see craft in action at a professional high level. And so I will like echo what Peter said about learning from everybody around you, you know, whether that's the technicians, the crew backstage, or the stage managers who are running rehearsal, or the repetitor who's running rehearsal, maestro, the artists who are working and learning and watching how they adapt and adjust and offer things and then take things back and make it better every time. Um, you know, I feel like it's truly the place that I learned that um, craft doesn't happen by accident. You know, the magic on stage does not happen by accident. It's not just like close your eyes, pray and hope that it's gonna happen. There are very specific conditions that occur in terms of people's preparations and those preparations all coming together um, that are really important. And so, the gift of my time in young artist programs, including, you know, young artist programs in the summer, Merrilla, um, Brevard Opera Center, um, the Banff Center, Nuova here, which was my first um, young artist program that I did twice. Uh, they're really those building block places that um, give you the opportunity to explore. And I will also say in hindsight, if I didn't realize it at the time, gave me a safe place to fail which was one of the biggest gifts, you know, we learn, I do not like failing. <laughs> However, I am at the point where I realized that failure is literally, when you have that safe place to do it, the best ways to learn um, and move forward and expand your vision of what you think is possible. Um, so yeah, young artist programs, you know, that's part of, it. yes, it's your bridge into other professional work, but I think it's really this, melting pot place time of who am I? What am I doing? Um, what are these other people doing? How does that relate to my work? Um, what can I learn from this? Um, how can I grow into this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the big thing too is, um, you mentioned it, Lara, is preparation. And um, I'm going to kind of segue into my next question for you, um, which is, how do you prepare? Like you've sung so many leading roles. What are your steps? What is your process? Um, for those of you that have not seen the show, Lara is like so beautifully, incredibly consistent when she, and, and gorgeous. And it's always like on fire. So um, 
and she knows exactly what to do and when. And, and, and you can see in her technique that her body is ready to do the thing, right? And she's, she knows exactly what she's doing. So this is, I would like to know for, for young artists, what are your steps? When you get a role, here is the role, you've never sung it before, what do you do? I mean, on, in an overarching way in terms of preparation for me, I always know that the more prepared I am, the more comfortable and safe I feel and more available I feel to try things once I get into the room. So that's part of the, beyond like that's the expectation that you come prepared for me personally, for me to be my best self in the rehearsal hall. Um, I know that I need to hit a level of comfort with everything I'm doing, comfort technically, comfort dramatically, um, comfort with the idea that things are gonna come flying at me that I don't expect and that are new. Um, so yeah, how do we do that? Um, if the show, the story has a, something that it's a source material thing that it's been pulled from. So, you know, for Bohème, um, Scène de la Vie de Bohème, Murché, I read that the first time I did the show. I haven't read it in a long time, full disclosure, but the first time I did the show, I read it, um, which gave me actually a really great little nugget that isn't in the opera for Musetta's character that for me made her that much more human. And in terms of her, what her relationship is with Marcello that we don't really see in the opera, but for me informs so much about what's in the opera. Um, then it's all the basics, right? Like learn your notes, learn your rhythms. Um, I like to work backwards, back to front, um, if I have the time and or take the hardest bits first and learn those first. Um, I think it's a very human thing that once we've learned something, we go back and repeat it because it feels good. It's like a nice little reward. You're like, yes, I know this. <laughs> and so um, if I can do that with the parts that are either most difficult or the parts that I'm going to sing when I'm most tired, which is at the end, um, that's bonus. Uh, of course, do all your translations. If you do not speak the language in which you are singing, um, make sure your diction is clear and correct and um, what's the word, organic. Uh, I like as a way to um, stay connected to the other parts within the score. Um, I like to chord my score like it was like a jazz score or like a pop song. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. I actually got a page. It's going to be mirrored. Uh, can we see a little bit? A little closer. Yeah. No, this way. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, that way. We'll let the camera focus. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Ah! there okay well you can kind of yep. see so you see like b plus so like okay that's b major so i know what i'm hearing in the band below me you know like it's not just about me and then you can see how i've marked the big beats so i know where i am how i feel um the rhythm and the internal pulse of the meter and then i've got all manner of technical notes for myself um you know all of these steps of going along through preparation um i happen to be really visual so i don't have to work very hard at memorization. I'm really lucky with that. Um, and for myself, I know that I'm close to being fully prepared when it's pretty much in my brain, mostly memorized like 90% and I don't have to work at it. So the times when I've actually had to work at memorization, it's that moment of, oh, maybe not quite as prepared as I should be, but here we are, we're gonna do it anyway. Um, so I think preparation is all the things you know you have to get accomplished, but then also knowing yourself really well to know what you need to be most comfortable when you enter that room and then available to explore within the process, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm opening up this next question to whoever wants to answer it, but I specifically said Peter, so we can have a few people on the screen, but if anybody has answers, just please type it in the chat. Um, for, in terms of, okay, so Peter and I have done three bohems together. This is our third production. Um, I've known Peter the longest, I would say. Yes, that's true, um, of all the people in the production. And I and uh, the thing is about Peter is you can't tell he's nervous. Um, and I don't know if you get nervous, Peter, so if I'm putting you on the spot, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But my question is, and this is a, a question that I actually had this week from a student, um, how do you manage nerves? How do you, what are, do you have tools that help you calm down before yeah. going up? How do you, the anxiety of something, how do you calm yourself down? I wish I had the perfect secrets, but 
No, but what do you do for yourself? You know, everyone has does something different, which is why I think it's good to, to be have honest. I think a lot of it piggybacks, believe it or not, on what Lara said about preparation. Um, if someone is very prepared, and very confident, it alleviates a lot of nerves, at right. least for me. I think this is very situational. It's very specific to the person. People deal with different anxieties or whatever um, in different situations. But I never usually get op nervous with opera um, because I try to be as prepared as I can be. And I think it's the role of us singers to prepare our parts so well that we come to rehearsal to learn other people's parts. Uh -huh. You know, you have to know your part solid. And the characterization, it doesn't always happen that way. I mean, I wish some... There's been points when I haven't been as prepared as I would like. And again, memorization for me, just like Lara said, it it doesn't it's not a problem because generally when you're prepared properly or enough, you don't have those problems. So um I've been lucky enough to be doing stage things since I was like five years old. And so I feel like so comfortable when I'm on stage. And um I don't get nervous. So I'm very lucky in that way. Now, to the point, auditions make me nervous. Auditions make me nervous. I, it's a different element. It's not what, you know, we train to be artists and performers on stage and to try to package that into five pieces or three pieces or two pieces and you want to do your very best and you really want to get into this place or you really want to get hired by this company. And it's not always your best. And for me, it's never my best. And I always die for people to hear me perform and get hired that way but it doesn't always happen that way so um there's a few thing tricks that i use um specifically for myself and these might not work for other people and they might sound absolutely crazy to other people and i hesitate to even say <laughs> but you have to pad your own ego a little bit you know you have to feel at least for me in an audition specific situation. I try, I'm always as prepared as I can be. And I use what Simone said. I go in and I try to show my own personality, who I am as a person. I try not to be awkward. I try to introduce myself if, if, it's, if I'm able to shake their hand or sometimes they don't want to, but you know what I mean? I try to show a little bit of myself before I sing, a little more, a little bit of my personality and be as calm as possible. And then I always, take auditions like they've heard a lot of singers today, but they haven't heard me today. So I try to push myself up and that's acting, that's performing, that's a part of who we are and what we do. And after you leave that audition, you can say whatever you want about what you did or how you performed. But when you're going in there, you have to have ultimate confidence in yourself and, and your own preparation and try to exude that confidence, not egotism, but confidence in who you are and what you have to offer. And if you don't get the job, you don't get the job. If you get the job, that's fabulous. But to go in there and um, be nervous or unsure or um, it's better not even to go in there. Mm -hmm. You have to go in there with gusto, ready to yeah. go and ready to show what you can. Um, then often sometimes it's just, you, it's inevitable. You're going to get nervous and your first few phrases are not necessarily the best they want. Remember these people that are hearing you have a lot of experience in this and they they will give you time they they are there to support they are there to want they want to hire you they want to hear the best you that you have to offer they they don't want to hear uh poor singing they don't want to hear you struggle hmm. generally in my experience it takes sometimes a few phrases to get to low in the breath to not get stacked up in nervousness and to push yourself through and then just treat it as a performance situation try to envision yourself on stage performing the, the piece that you can in as, without staging, but as much confidence as you can. And I feel that that will get through to them. And once you start singing better, you feel more confident and then you don't get as nervous. That's just okay. a few little things for me. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's different for everyone, like you said, but patting the ego is great. Finding your power, I call it finding your power. Yeah. And I also think about breathing. I breathe a lot before I go in. 
because that calms me right down. Breathing makes me sleepy, and that's that's good. <laughs> and it also energizes me, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, we, we actually had this question from um, Diana. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, have, a, I wonder if I can find her wording. Um, where is it? If I can't, I'll have my wording because it's the same question. Um, basically, what advice would you give yourself if you were to go back to university or student life? So, um, so your younger self, that, those were the words that Diana used. Um, so we'll just go really quickly because we're running out of time. I can't believe it. We've had so much to say. It's very exciting. Okay, um, let's go Simon first. Hmm. Uh, I would tell myself to be more curious. Uh, I feel that for orchestral conductors especially, but also uh, violinists, um, we are given a path. Uh, we're given a series of repertoire that we should learn. Um, you know, Beethoven symphonies, Schubert symphonies, Puccini operas, and I, I, I wish I had been more curious from age 18, 19, 20 and go a little bit off the traditional path and find the jewels that I wanted to find and the repertoire that I wanted to, to uh, study. Um, I feel that until I was 25 or 26, uh, I was kind of spoon-fed repertoire. Uh, I was given a tradition. I was, and I, I wish I had been a little bit more badass about it early on <laughs> and, and you know, go off track and, and do my own thing. Yeah, I love that. Luca? I am a big proponent of mentorship. And so coming from someone who isn't too far away from my experience of university, I have really, in the last couple of years, um, what's the expression, like reap the, the benefits of meeting as many people as possible. And that's the biggest thing that I would I would uh, tell people who are in university right now. Talk to as many people as you can, sing for as many people as you can, because you will learn from each of those um, those experiences and from each of those people having having uh, that exchange with you as well. Mm -hmm. um, Lara? I guess I would just reiterate what I said about failure early. Um, you know, embrace failure. Uh, it's good to have a goal in mind in terms of like, I want to achieve this thing in this moment, but sometimes to just give yourself permission to be like, I don't know what's gonna happen. Let's just see, maybe it'll be terrible. Maybe it'll be amazing. And then judge after, um, yeah. When I was given those safe places to fail, I wish I had taken better advantage of that. Hmm. Peter? I, I, I saw this question before. I don't really have a good answer. I think it's, um, I'm happy for all my experiences and ups and downs and learnings. Um, safe place to fail. There's not many safe places to fail in my experience. So if I had something to tell myself, it would be, but this is not when I was very young. It's kind of I'm still learning this process that learn the voice, learn what's right repertoire for yourself. Um, it's very hard for young artists or artists to not take every gig given to you, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. every gig is not necessarily the best gig. And to go in and sing something that's totally not in your fach and it's not your repertoire and sing it poorly is not always the best option if you can financially afford it. Um, yeah, it's always, good. it's, it's very important to always do your best. So, um, that's just real talk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Noah and he says, um, thank you for sharing this time with us. Uh, with La Boheme in particular, how do the pop culture retellings influence the ways you approach your character? Does anyone want to take this one? I'll take it. Okay. Look I, um, I grew up with musical theater and so Rent was a very influential to me when um, in my early teenagehood um, and um, for my character Chonard is uh, in Rent the equivalent is uh, Angel Dumas Chonard um, and she is this like beam of light that's just energy and hope to people and I try to infuse as much as I can into into this character that same feeling that 
Jonathan Larson in this case, um, the the composer of, of Rent, took from his his interpretation of Bohem and brought it into this character. So someone saw this character and and saw and created a new character out of this. And this is true of each of these characters in Bohem. Mm. Wonderful. I'm gonna take one and hopefully one more. So I'm I'm really uh, so um uh, I think it's Ali. I'm not sure. Um, a songbird. Um, what aria did you use for your audition for this production? How do you pick what song to use to showcase yourself? Um, should the song choice change depending on the show you are auditioning for? Who wants to take this one? Um, <laughs> <Peter. laughs> I think sometimes the song choice should uh, your choices and reps. I mean, standard, we have five standard pieces that we always try to lock in and be ready to go at any period of time um, that um, that shows your voice at where it is right now and the kind of roles that you would like to do. Um, I wouldn't change that too much, uh, depending on, um, unless it's something specifically from that, art, that opera that they want to hear, that you feel confident with, that you've prepared. Um, um what did i sing for this for this role um i didn't <laughs> they, they came i think they came and saw us in the calgary peter <laughs> right exactly that's mm -hmm. what happened mm -hmm. so they saw our production in calgary a couple of years ago pre-pandemic and uh and i was uh, honored to be asked to do this production so mm -hmm. it's you know I, you get sometimes to a point where you don't always audition but um like peter said five you have your five standards and people can usually hear, you know, if 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 you're lucky, they're doing one of those operas, you know, in your five. Well, but, it can yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it can parallel, but really they can tell, people can tell if you can sing something from your five that you've chosen. Um, wonderful. And then uh, I'll just uh, do one more question and then we'll hopefully, I think we'll, we'll have time. This one should be quick. I'll, I'll pick Lara for this one. Of all your performances and costumes, what was your favorite costume and what role did you play? Oh, wow. I mean, this show has been amazing. I've been really lucky to have some amazing costumes um, in shows. But uh, this show, Dina's costumes are so beautiful. And what has been an especial privilege here is that um, they were made for my body. Uh, especially when you're in period in a corset, you can't ever see my corset, but I actually have a proper corset underneath the dresses, um, which both helps shape my body and also carry the weight in a, a physical, technical way of all the petticoats of the skirt, which can also affect your singing and how your alignment is for your body. Um, you know, this has been, if not the top, one of my top costume experiences, you know, three amazing detailed, like, the costumes are just as beautiful up close as they are from afar on the stage. And every one of those people um, from Dina Designing to everybody who's created those costumes are craftspeople and artisans with this enormous amount of knowledge, not just about the clothing, but about how clothing represents character and story, which is so, so important. It's not just here's a pretty dress, it's here's a pretty dress that tells this and this and this about your character. And then my job is to use those costume elements to heighten what I've already brought into this character. You know, the first time I put on that red dress for act two for Musetta, I was like, oh yes, I'm no longer Lara Jakevich. I'm now this like saucy, you know, woman that everybody thinks is beautiful. And I like actually have a hot chance of thinking that that's true for myself. Even me, I'm like, uh, feel a little awkward. That's not who I really am in real life. But like you put the dress on and you're like, yes, the dress made the lady. Here I am. All of a sudden I'm like strutting around the stage. Like, you know, I've never strut before. So all that to say um, here. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I, I mean, thank you all so much. I have to wrap up. I could talk to you for days, maybe weeks. Thank you so much for answering all these wonderful questions. I know people will have more. I'm sorry that we can't get to them. But um, we're so excited to bring you one more show tomorrow night. So come and see us. And if you can't come tomorrow, or if you can and you want to see more, um, Cosi Fan Tutte plays in March. And you can find um, the details on Edmonton Opera's website. 
Thank you all so much. I, I can't thank you enough. I'm, I have so much gratitude and we hope to see you very soon.